So tonight I'm very excited to be speaking on one of my favorite topics, all about the gut microbiome and optimizing your health. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Rajshree Nambudrupad. I'm board certified in internal medicine and a member of the medical staff at St. Jude Medical Center. And my practice is called OC Integrative Medicine in Fullerton. I also did additional training in gastroenterology at UC Irvine and then later I did training in functional gastroenterology through the Institute for Functional Medicine. So this has given me a really unique perspective on digestive health. And in my practice, I like to combine the best of conventional Western medicine along with more integrative and holistic medicine. And I find that this approach provides great outcomes for all types of digestive issues. So let's get started. So here's an overview of my talk. So we're gonna talk about what is the gut microbiome. We're gonna go over probiotics and prebiotics. What is IBS or irritable bowel syndrome? What is leaky gut? What is SIBO, which stands for small intestine bacterial overgrowth? And then how do we test and evaluate your gut health? We'll go over food allergies. And then we'll discuss what is the optimal diet for your overall health? So what is the gut microbiome? So the gut microbiome is your ecosystem of trillions of bacteria that line your digestive tract. It's controlled by your diet, your exposures, and even your stress level. So human beings are actually holobiomes, which means we're made out of trillions of living organisms inside of us. In fact, there's so much bacteria inside of our digestive tract, if you were to weigh it out, it would weigh three pounds, which is the same as the human brain. So what determines our microbiome? So it begins with your genetics. So the microbiome of your mother and your father. Then your birth method. So if you were born by vaginal delivery, you get exposed to the bacteria going through the birth canal. So unfortunately, uh, children born by C-section don't get that same exposure to the mother's vaginal uh, bacteria. But what I understand in a lot of hospitals now, they're actually swabbing down C-section babies with the mother's vaginal bacteria to kind of replicate going through the birth canal because they know that bacteria is so important for the microbiome. So breastfeeding. So when an infant breastfeeds, they get exposed to all the protective immunoglobulins which are present in breast milk. And that is so beneficial for the microbiome. Your diet, so if someone eating a standard American diet is gonna have a completely different microbiome from someone eating a clean, organic, whole foods diet. Exercise, so it's fascinating, but research is showing that exercise has its own positive influence on the microbiome, separate from diet and exposures. Your exposures, so if you're exposed to antibiotics, you know, prescription medications, if you're on long-term acid suppressive medications or synthetic hormones, that can all affect the microbiome. And then stress, so if you're chronically stressed and your cortisol is high, cortisol is the bad stress hormone, then that's gonna also have an influence on the type of bacteria growing in your gut. So all disease begins in the gut. This was once said by Hippocrates. So the gut microbiome can really determine your overall health. Your gut microbiome could be controlling your weight, your metabolism, your immune system, your skin, your hormones, and even your mood. A lot of research is evolving on the gut microbiome. You know, having an overabundance of certain bacteria or an imbalance can lead to something called dysbiosis. And dysbiosis can cause many systemic health issues. It can cause IBS, autoimmune disease, mood disorders, chronic fatigue, and chronic pain. Microbiome disruption is also linked to more common conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, arterial plaque buildup, Alzheimer's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and even mental health diseases like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and more. Colon cancers and other cancers are also linked to dysbiosis in the gut. Children who have microbiome issues are more likely to, to develop food allergies. 
and adults who have microbiome disruption are more likely to develop food sensitivities. A lot of times, once we heal the microbiome, a lot of the food sensitivities go away. So does our gut affect our brain? So scientists are now recognizing something called the gut-brain axis. So a significant portion of your neurotransmitters, like serotonin and dopamine, are actually made in your gut. So that's why they sometimes refer to your gut as the second brain. So that's why when your gut is having problems, like bloating, constipation, abdominal pain, your mood will often suffer as well. So many patients who have IBS are actually thought to have a deficiency of serotonin in the gut, which is why in conventional medicine, they treat a lot of IBS patients with antidepressant medications. And these medications raise the serotonin level, not simply in the brain, but also in the gut as well. So in my practice, when I see a patient who has anxiety or depression, I always ask about their gut health. You know, what are they eating? How are they digesting their food? How are their bowel movements? If they're constipated or bloated, they could be having microbiome issues that are leading to an imbalance of the neurotransmitters which are causing their mood symptoms. So many times, once we correct their digestive issues and get them to have regular bowel movements and a healthier microbiome, their mood symptoms resolve as well. Okay, so there was a review article that came out in 2018 in the Journal of Neuropsychobiology, and there is a link to the full article on my website, but this was a very fascinating article. It talked about how important nutrition and the gut microbiome are for healthy mood. So science and research is now supporting the importance of the gut-brain axis. So why are the bacteria in our gut so important? Well, it's because they eat what we eat. And depending on what we eat, we can influence the type of bacteria that are growing in our gut. So food influences the microbiome. So the bacteria use the food that we eat and they break it down into bioactive substances. So the type of diet we're eating can change the chemicals that are being released by the bacteria into our body. And these are chemicals that determine our weight our immune system, our metabolism, our hormones, our skin, and even our mood. So for example, there's research that's been done on obese mice and thin mice. What happens when they transplant the bacteria from the obese mice into the thin mice? The thin mice become obese. And vice versa, when they transplant the bacteria from the thin mice into the obese mice, the obese mice will lose weight and become thin. Isn't that fascinating? So when I see a patient in my practice who's really struggling with their weight, and when I review their diet and their exercise, it's pretty impeccable. They're doing a great job. That's when we have to look at their gut microbiome because maybe there's something there that's causing them to hold on to the weight. So the bacteria in your gut can even control some of your cravings because the bacteria live off the foods that you're eating. So if you have some bad bacteria in your gut that are living off the sugar and dairy in your diet, you're gonna continue to crave those foods. So that's why making that initial change in your diet can be so difficult. So skin is often a reflection of your microbiome. So when I look at a patient's face, I, I often get a little window into their gut microbiome. You know, patients who are overindulging in sugar, fast foods, or alcohols, tend to have more dull skin with blemishes and sometimes even a little swelling in the face. You know, acne is a bacterial imbalance on the skin that often uh, is a reflection of a bacterial imbalance in the gut. Similarly, rosacea, which is the redness that you get on the cheeks and your nose, that is often linked to gut microbiome issues and like a sensitivity to sugars and carbohydrates in the diet. Now the great news is that when a patient cleans up their diet, within a few weeks to a few months, we see such a drastic difference in their skin and in their face. And that's a reflection of their gut microbiome getting healthier as well. So what disrupts the gut microbiome? So sugar is a big disruptor of the gut microbiome. So by sugar, I mean refined sugar. Sugar feeds all the bad bacteria in the gut the kind that cause inflammation, weight gain, and trigger more sugar cravings. Artificial sugars are also bad for the gut microbiome since they often feed some of the bad bacteria in your gut 
that cause dysbiosis. So a lot of artificial sugars, for example, xylitol, mannitol, sorbitol, they can't be absorbed by the body, but that leaves it in your gut for the bacteria to have a field day and ferment that into gas and cause bloating. So far, only stevia is considered safe on the gut, but even that I recommend to use sparingly because I have seen patients who are really sensitive and get digestive distress when they use products with stevia. So alcohol is bad for the gut microbiome because it turns into sugar. And that's why a lot of times we'll see skin symptoms flare. For example, someone with rosacea will see that flare when they indulge in a lot of sugar or alcohol. Antibiotics, so antibiotics are powerful tools. You know, they're very helpful to kill bad bacterial infections in our body. But the downside is that they also kill some of the good bacteria in our gut. You can also be exposed to antibiotics if you're eating conventionally raised poultry, meats, and dairy products. So this is another reason why it's so important to be uh, selective in, and only use antibiotics when absolutely necessary. A lot of times antibiotics are over-prescribed, sometimes for viral infections, when they're not really necessary. So in my practice, I'm very judicious in prescribing antibiotics only when I feel absolutely necessary. And I always remind my patients to take probiotics along, alongside the antibiotics to protect the good bacteria in the gut. One example of antibiotics throwing off the microbiome will be when a woman takes antibiotics for something and three days later, she has a vaginal yeast infection. That's something we see very commonly. And it's because the antibiotics threw off the gut microbiome, which then threw off the vaginal microbiome. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are NSAIDs. Examples are like ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen. These medications are very hard on the gut. And interestingly, they're, they're called anti-inflammatory drugs, but they're actually inflammatory on the gut lining. Synthetic hormones. So these are like the hormones present in birth control pills. So these can also affect the gut microbiome. So this is why a lot of times when women start birth control pills, they gain weight and they feel really bloated. So my preference in my practice is to use bioidentical hormones. And the nice thing with that is we can often use that topically. So in a patient who's having a lot of gut issues, bloating issues, I will just prescribe the hormones topically so they don't even go through your gut. Sid suppressive medications. So if you've been on Prilosec or omeprazole or Prevacid for a long time, and there's a lot of people who have been on them for 5, 10, or 20 years. That can definitely change your gut microbiome because that's going to change how you break down proteins in your diet. Infections. So if you have a gut infection with a parasite, a yeast, a virus, any of these can affect your microbiome. Stress. So again, cortisol, the bad stress hormone, is going to influence the type of bacteria that grow in your gut. Pesticides can affect your microbiome. GMO foods, so genetically modified foods. So when an insect eats a GMO crop, do you know what happens? Its intestines explode. So imagine what happens in humans, especially in sensitive individuals. You know, over time, all that GMO wheat corn, soybean oil, really take a toll on the gut. It can lead to um, chronic disease such as irritable bowel syndrome, autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, and other chronic diseases. So inflammatory oils, so by this I mean the vegetable oils, so corn oil, soybean, canola. These are, can definitely cause inflammation in the gut, and we see such improvement when patients cut it out of their diet. We see improvement in hormones, you know, a lot of women will tell me their menstrual cramps are significantly improved, and we also see a lot of improvement in skin as well. So chemical disinfectants, so these are like soaps, detergents, cleaning chemicals, even mouthwashes. So this is why, if possible, it's preferable to use more natural household cleaners like baking soda, vinegar, and essential oils whenever possible. And then finally, surgery. So if you have surgery on your gut, like you have your gallbladder removed, or your appendix removed, or you're going through bariatric surgery for weight loss. All of these can affect your microbiome. So what improves the microbiome? So eating a clean, organic diet with lots of vegetables is so good for the microbiome. 
fermented foods. So these are foods that naturally have good bacteria because the fermentation process allows bacteria to grow. So these are like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir. There's actually dairy kefir and there's also coconut kefir for people who are dairy sensitive. Interaction with the soil, the earth, and pets is also beneficial to the microbiome. Sometimes taking a probiotic supplement, again, probiotics are the good bacteria for your gut, can be so helpful to the microbiome. Fiber. So in addition to getting your fiber from your diet and your vegetables, sometimes patients do benefit from additional fiber as a supplement, and that can help as well. Exercise. So like I mentioned, research is showing exercise has its own beneficial impact on your gut bacteria. And finally, having a good circadian rhythm, meaning you go to bed on time and you wake up on time with the sun, that is also important for a healthy gut microbiome. So should I take a probiotic? So this is a question that I'm often asked. So probiotics are the good bacteria for your gut. Some examples of this are like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and the yeast probiotic called Saccharomyces boulardii. So it really depends on your symptoms. So if you're having symptoms of digestive imbalances, such as heartburn, irregular bowel habits, bloating, abdominal pain, then I'll generally recommend a probiotic. If there's a suspicion that there's a microbiome issue, such as a patient who's seeing me for acne or recurrent vaginal yeast infections, then I'll definitely recommend probiotics. Sometimes we do hold off on probiotics until after the patient has submitted a gut microbiome test, which I'll talk about today. So there are different doses of probiotics depending on your symptoms. So if I sense that the patient really needs a gut microbiome reboot, I will give them a pretty strong probiotic. We'll do like 225 billion colony forming units, five or more strains, and it'll typically have something called arabinogalactans, which are the prebiotic seeds to help recolonize and reboot the microbiome. For treating minor digestive imbalances, I'll do like 100 billion colony forming units, five or more strains. And then for just maintaining a healthy gut, we'll typically do like 20 billion, five or more strains. So prebiotics are the food for the probiotics. So prebiotics are the fiber that's found in vegetables and fruits. So for example, apples, bananas, they have prebiotic fiber. The issue is that prebiotics in supplement form or in health bars can be a problem for a lot of patients who have bloating issues. And if a patient um, has a lot of bloating, and I suspect they may have SIBO, which I'm gonna talk about today. SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. These are patients who need to avoid supplements with prebiotics. And sometimes a lot of health bars put it in their ingredient list as inulin or chicory root because it helps to raise their fiber level, but these things cause a tremendous bloating for these patients. So fermented foods are a great way to get natural probiotics from food. So again, this is like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir. Even if you eat one or two tablespoons a day, it does help your microbiome. And then fiber is so important for the probiotics to, to thrive because your gut bacteria live off the fiber in your diet. So I always encourage patients, start with your diet, eat lots of vegetables, and then sometimes we do add additional fiber. So what is irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS? So IBS is a clinical diagnosis based on the Rome criteria. So it's basically when a patient has frequent abdominal pain and fluctuating bowel habits. And typically they'll say that their abdominal pain improves after a bowel movement. There's three types of IBS. There's IBS-C, which is constipation predominant IBS. So these patients, you know, they'll have a bowel movement like every three days, they're really constipated, it's a real struggle for them. IBS-D is the diarrhea predominant IBS. So these are patients who, they run to the bathroom after every meal, they're going three, four times a day, very loose stools. Here's IBS-M. This is mixed IBS, where a patient has a fluctuation in their bowel habits, ranging from constipation to diarrhea. Let's face it, IBS is a vague diagnosis. You know, it's kind of a way to label symptoms. It's often treated with antidepressants because antidepressants 
reduce pain signals going from the gut to the brain. But how can we really address root causes of IBS? And how can we help patients manage their IBS symptoms? So what are some of the root causes of IBS symptoms? So the first thing I typically will do is we want to rule out celiac disease. Celiac disease is a genetic immune reaction to gluten, which is a protein in all wheat products. And it's fairly common, like one in 100 Caucasians have celiac disease. And celiac patients do, unfortunately, need to eliminate gluten from their diet um, 100% to really recover. So this can easily be ruled out with a blood test. We check for tissue transglutaminase, IgA. The only thing to keep in mind is that the patient does have to be exposed to some gluten within two weeks of the test for it to be accurate. Otherwise, you can have a false negative result. So gut infection. So if a patient has an infection with a parasite like Giardia, maybe they went camping and they got a parasite, or a bad bacteria like H. pylori, or maybe they even have a subtle parasite like Blastocystis hominis, any of these things can cause symptoms of IBS. Food allergies or sensitivities can definitely mimic IBS. Having a poor diet, if the patient's eating a lot of processed foods, a lot of bad oils, that could be causing them symptoms. Maybe they have SIBO. So I'm gonna talk about SIBO today. Again, it's the small intestine bacterial overgrowth, and it's now known to be a big root cause of IBS symptoms. It's their stress in their lives, because you know the big mind-body connection, stress can affect your gut. Again, maybe it's gut inflammation. Maybe it's their foods they're eating. Maybe they're on an inflammatory diet, or maybe they're on certain medications that are causing them these side effects. Finally, maybe it's microbial dysbiosis. This is basically an imbalance in your gut bacteria. Maybe you have an overgrowth of certain bac and commensal bacteria, such as Klebsiella, Citrobacter, or Serratia, and that's causing your symptoms. So how do I treat IBS in my practice? So the first thing I do is I always test and find out your food allergies. This is so important because food allergies are not always obvious. The patient I... figure out what their food sensitivities are as well. Okay. Test and we'll exclude SIBO as well as gut infections. And then we'll treat those things if we find those problems. We'll okay. work on cleaning up the diet. We may get more fiber if we need to to feed the microbiome. And then I'll definitely counsel them on natural ways to bring relief when their symptoms flare. So let me give you a case example of IBS. So Sarah is a 21-year-old college student who was diagnosed with IBS-C. She oh. has every three days. She's had multiple ER visits for abdominal pain. She had a colonoscopy and a CT scan. Both were negative. So she was put on amitriptyline by her gastroenterologist to manage her pain symptoms. So amitriptyline is an antidepressant medication and it's prescribed in IBS to reduce the pain signals from the gut to the brain. So then Sarah comes to see me. The first thing I do is I put Sarah on magnesium citrate, about 500 milligrams every night. Magnesium is probably my number one preferred agent to help patients with constipation. And the reason is because magnesium has so many other beneficial effects on the body. Magnesium is great for muscle relaxation, for deep sleep, for anxiety, for liver, liver detox pathways, and for hormonal health. So for all these reasons, magnesium is my number one for constipation. I run her allergy tests and found out she was allergic to oats. She had a class four to oats, which is pretty significant, and she was eating oat bars every day. We then ran an extensive functional stool test and we discovered she had a parasite infection, a subtle parasite with Blastocystis hominis. So I treated her parasite with some antibiotics and I gave her strong probiotics to help reboot her microbiome. Then I changed her diet. I had her eliminate oats, dairy, all sugar, processed foods, vegetable oils. I kept her on the magnesium, 500 milligrams every night. And then, whenever her symptoms would flare, I had her massage her abdomen with a special essential oil called Digest Zen. Digest Zen is made by doTERRA, and it's a combination of fennel, ginger, peppermint, all the things that promote gut motility. And the amazing thing is it works topically. So I'll have her like put six drops, mix it with a little carrier oil like coconut or olive oil, and massage her abdomen for a full minute. 
The amazing thing, this works really well for patients. So 10 minutes later, they feel their abdominal pain is significantly reduced. They may pass some gas and the pressure is reduced and they feel that it, it helps manage their pain whenever it flares. So two months later, Sarah is doing great. She's having large bowel movements every day. Her abdominal pain is now much improved since eliminating the oats, dairy, and sugar. And she uses the Digest Zen essential oil whenever she needs to. And she's off the amitriptyline. So this is a good example showing how healing heal IBS by getting to the root causes of symptoms. So now let's talk about leaky gut. How many of you have heard of leaky gut? Wow, I'm impressed, okay. So leaky gut is also known as abnormal intestinal permeability. So the lining of our GI tract is actually only one cell layer thick. And the cells that line your, your gut are called enterocytes. It was designed this way to make it easy for us to absorb nutrients from our gut. But the downside is that if your gut is traumatized by toxins, sugar, inflammatory foods, ibuprofen, antibiotics, or stress, there can be disruption in the tight junctions between the cells or the enterocytes, and that can cause impaired gut permeability, also known as leaky gut. Now, there is an objective way to diagnose this condition, and that's by measuring zonulin level in the stool. So zonulin will be elevated if there's any disruption in between the tight junctions between those enterocytes. So if zonulin is elevated, the patient has leaky gut. So leaky gut allows foods and other environmental toxins to readily enter the bloodstream and cause immune dysregulation. You know, we're constantly exposed to viruses and bacteria in the environment. So our gut is our first line of defense against all the incoming toxins. So the lining of our gut has tremendous immune cells. That's why they say your biggest immune system is in your gut. So dysregulation in the barrier of your gut can lead to systemic inflammation and autoimmune disease, such as Hashimoto's thyroid disease, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease, which is like Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. I'll give you a case example of leaky gut. Sandra is a 40-year-old woman, about 15 pounds overweight. She's using ibuprofen almost daily for her headaches. Diet is the standard American diet, or the SAD diet. <laughs> so by this, I'm referring to fast foods, processed foods, sugary drinks. She has a lot of stress from her job and her long commute. She starts get noticing that she's getting pain in her joints after meals and that she, when she has a cocktail, she notices she gets achiness in her joints within minutes. So Sandra's primary doctor sent her to a rheumatologist. So she's tested for rheumatoid arthritis, but it's negative. So her rheumatologist puts her on meloxicam to help manage her joint symptoms. So meloxicam is a pain medication in the NSAID family. So it's kind of in the ibuprofen family. And just like ibuprofen, it can be really harsh on the gut. So she starts using the meloxicam daily, which gives her temporary relief, but now she's feeling dependent on it every day for the pain. And she's not even really sure if this is addressing her underlying problem. Then Sandra comes to see me and we do a very comprehensive blood work. We find out that she has a positive TPO antibody and that's the thyroid peroxidase antibody consistent with Hashimoto's thyroid disease. So this is autoimmune thyroid disease. And the TPO antibody basically attacks the thyroid and causes inflammation in the thyroid. And ESR, which is the SED rate, and CRP are elevated. So these are inflammation markers in her blood. Her gut microbiome test and find that her zonulin is elevated. Remember, zonulin means there's disruption in the tight junctions between her gut cells, the enterocytes. So she has leaky gut who has another marker of inflammation in her stool called the fecal secretory IgA, which is high. Basically, Sandra is inflamed. Her main problem is inflammation. And basically, the inflammation that's causing the leaky gut and the disruption in the intestinal permeability is then causing her to have the systemic inflammation that's causing her joint pains and also causing the autoimmune thyroid disease thing is meloxicam reduces pain in the joints but it can actually worsen the inflammation in the gut so it leads to like a vicious cycle of inflammation in the body. 
So how do we treat Sandra? So first, you know, we clean up her diet. We have her avoid all refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and trans fat. We have her avoid all the ibuprofen and meloxicam. Give her a special amino acid called glutamine. Glutamine is healing to the enterocytes that line the gut. We also have her drink some bone broth because bone broth is naturally rich in glutamine. Probiotics to reboot and recolonize her microbiome. Her B-complex vitamins to help with her sugar cravings. And then lastly, I give her fish oil, omega-3 fatty acids to help reduce inflammation. For pain, if absolutely necessary, you know, I'll have her use Tylenol because Tylenol does not cause any inflammation in the gut. And then sometimes I also prescribe topical ketoprofen gel. So ketoprofen is like ibuprofen, but because it's topical, a patient can just apply it on the joint that's bothering them and they don't have to use something that's gonna affect their gut. Two months later, Sandra comes to see me and she's lost 10 pounds. She no longer feels inflamed. Her joint pain is gone. Her headaches are gone. And her TPO antibody for her Hashimoto's thyroid disease is down 50%. And then her sed rate and CRP, the inflammation markers in her blood, have normalized. So this is a good example showing how treating gut inflammation and leaky gut can help reduce inflammation in your whole body and lead to better regulation of the immune system in autoimmune disease. Now let's talk about SIBO. So how many of you have heard of SIBO? Okay, wonderful. So SIBO stands for Small Intestine Bacterial Overgrowth. So your small intestines or your small bowel does not have a lot of bacteria. Most of the bacteria are located in your colon or large intestine. You know, it was designed this way because your small intestines uh, job is really to absorb the nutrients from your diet. So, but patients who get SIBO basically have bad bacteria that have gotten into the small intestine. And so these bacteria cause a lot of gas, bloating, and abdominal pain. So why do people get SIBO? So risk factors for SIBO are like chronic constipation, if you're exposed to a lot of antibiotics, if you've been on acid suppressive medication for a long time, or if you've had intestinal surgeries. So patients with SIBO have really significant gas, bloating, and belching, and abdominal pain. I mean, these are patients who tell me they're bloated all the time. They wake up in the morning and they're bloated. They drink water and they're bloated. And it's because these bad bacteria in the small intestine are producing either hydrogen gas or methane gas or both. SIBO patients also suffer from systemic symptoms. So they suffer from fatigue, brain fog, joint pains. They can have changes in their bowel habits. And they can even suffer from malnutrition because the SIBO bacteria are using up all their nutrients. In fact, SIBO is classically associated with low B12 levels. So we're now recognizing that SIBO is an underlying root cause of IBS. SIBO was actually discovered by Dr. Mark Pimentel, gastroenterologist at Cedar sinai in 2006. So oh. patients, they feel yucky and bloated all the time. They're becoming allergic to and more sensitive to foods in their diet. They can even become sensitive to histamines in the diet. So they feel very limited in what they can eat in order to avoid the bloating. So here's a SIBO case example. So Henry is a man who feels bloated all the time, struggled with constipation most of his life. He's been on antibiotics a few times in the last year. And it's a standard American diet, he's diabetes. How do we test Henry for SIBO? So the test to diagnose SIBO is called a lactulose breath test. So lactulose is a non-absorbable sugar. So your body cannot absorb it at all, but that leaves it in the gut. So if you have the SIBO bacteria there, they're gonna ferment that lactulose into either hydrogen or methane or both. So the test is designed this way. So first you collect a baseline breath, then you get the lactulose, and then every 20 minutes you collect your breath. So a positive test will be a rise in hydrogen and methane production over the course of the three hours. 
The interesting thing is that the hydrogen predominant SIBO is associated with loose stools or IBSD, the diarrhea predominant IBS. And then the methane predominant SIBO is associated with constipation or IBSC, the constipation predominant IBS. So that's kind of a fascinating thing. So how do we treat SIBO? So it is a three-part approach. We have to kill the bacteria, starve the bacteria, and promote motility. So to kill the bacteria, we use uh, SIBO-specific antibiotics or herbal antimicrobials. The antibiotics we use are like rifaximin or neomycin, but more typically neomycin. Neomycin and rifaximin, they are kind of special in that they are 90%, they will only work in your gut. So that's the nice thing. It doesn't have quite the systemic side effects of a lot of standard antibiotics. So there was a publication that came out that showed that herbal antimicrobials are equally effective to antibiotics in treating SIBO. So I do also use herbal antimicrobials in my practice, and the ones I use are berberine and oregano oil. I'm seeing excellent outcomes, both with antibiotics and with herbal antimicrobials. So I always discuss both options with the patient, and then we decide which would be best for them. So the second part of SIBO treatment is we need to starve the bacteria. So to starve the bacteria, we put the patient on a low FODMAP, low lectin diet. So FODMAP stands for fermentable oligodimonosaccharides and polyols. Fancy word, but basically <laughs> FODMAP foods are starchy things like breads and pastas. So we get rid of those things. Lectins are basically the outer protective coating on whole grains and legumes that can be really hard on the gut, especially in IBS patients. So we'll have the patient avoid things like quinoa, beans, and certain seeded vegetables like cucumbers. So an easy way to think of this diet is it's basically a paleo diet. Um, we have them eliminate sugars, even fruit. We do allow these patients to have white basmati rice. White basmati is very easy on the gut and it has no lectins. And we also allow them to have yams. So the diet is a little tricky, so I have it completely outlined on a handout. So they just kind of follow that. And the third part of the SIBO treatment is promote motility. So to do this, first step is no snacking between meals. And this is because you need four to five hours between meals to allow your small bowel to have a wave of con contractility to move things and sweep out the small bowel. So if you're constantly snacking on things, you don't get a chance for your small bowel to clean out. And then we wanna make sure that the patient's having a good bowel movement every day. And so for this, we'll use magnesium citrate or we may use other natural things like aloe or something called modal pro. Modal pro is made by pure encapsulations, and it's a combination of ginger and 5-HTP. You know, ginger is a natural promotility agent on the gut, and 5-HTP is the precursor to serotonin in the gut, so it also helps promote motility. Now, the good news is this diet is not permanent. It's just for the course of treatment, so it's for about a month or a little bit longer, and then we will gradually introduce foods back into the diet. In rare cases when it's very, we're having trouble er, um, eradicating the SIBO, we do something called an el uh, elemental diet. So it's basically a liquid diet where you use a special formula that gives your body all the nutrients it needs, but it will 100% starve the SIBO bacteria. And this elemental diet is extremely effective at eradicating SIBO. So let's get back to Henry's case example. So he does the breath test and it shows that he has the methane predominant SIBO. And this makes sense because remember the methane one is associated with constipation and he's been struggling with constipation. Treat Henry with neomycin, 500 milligrams twice a day for two weeks along with the SIBO diet. And then I give him magnesium citrate, 500 milligrams every night at bedtime to help move his bowels said I always talk to patients about the herbal antimicrobial options and the antibiotic options but in Henry's case we chose the antibiotics because he was already on berberine for his diabetes so berberine happens to be amazing for blood sugar regulation so he was already on it so it made sense to try the antibiotics for him so after four weeks Henry comes to follow up and his bloating is gone 
he's having a regular bowel movement every day and he's actually using less magnesium citrate, only 250 milligrams. His energy, his mental sharpness, his sleep have all improved. He's even lost five pounds and his fasting blood sugars look so much better as well. One of the amazing things we see is when we, when we get rid of SIBO, patients who were struggling with constipation all their lives, their bowel movements have now normalized. And the opposite is true. Those who are suffering from diarrhea all their lives, their bowel movements are now normal. So that's pretty amazing. Now SIBO is notorious for coming back. So that's a big issue. So I encourage my patients to continue to eat well. You don't wanna go back to your old eating patterns. You really wanna limit sugar and refined starches in the diet and avoid excessive snacking between meals. And we also wanna make sure that these patients are having really good bowel movements every day to prevent the SIBO from coming back. So how healthy is your gut? So how can we determine how well your gut is processing your food? A lot of patients will come to see me after they've already had an upper endoscopy, a colonoscopy, and they didn't find anything, but they're still having symptoms. So while these tests are important, they only show the structure, the anatomical structure of your esophagus, stomach, and colon. They don't really tell us if you have SIBO, leaky gut, if there's a bacterial imbalance, if there's an infection with a parasite or yeast, how you're digesting your proteins and fats. So for that, for, to find out all of this information, I use something called a functional gut microbiome test. And I use the GIFX stool profile by Genova Diagnostics. So Genova is a CLIA certified lab. So I find that their results are very, very accurate. And I have looked at a lot of microbiome tests over the years. I've looked at GI map, doctor's data, biome, but I find the Genova one to be the most accurate and the most beneficial for the patient. So the way this test is done is it's done from your stool. So you have to submit your stool and then you mail it out through FedEx. It takes about a month to come back. And it's a very extensive 10 page report on everything related to your gut. So let me walk you through the sections of the test. The first section, it tells us how are you digesting your food? It'll tell me how much protein is in your stool, how much fat in your stool. It'll tell me how your pancreatic enzyme production. So is your pancreas doing a good job? The second section of the test is all the inflammation markers. It'll measure something called calprotectin Calprotectin is a more serious marker of inflammation in the gut. It's elevated in like colon cancers and in inflammatory bowel disease. It'll measure eosinophil protein X, which is seen in parasites or food allergies. And then it measures fecal secretory IgA, which is a more nonspecific marker of inflammation. It could be seen from stress or the foods you're eating or from ibuprofen. It'll also measure the zonulin, the test for leaky gut. So the next section of the test is looking at your microbiome. So they measure something called short chain fatty acids. So when you eat fiber in your diet, your, the bacteria break it down into short chain fatty acids. So that is something that they'll measure and tell me if your diet needs supplemental fiber. P having the low short chain fatty acids has been associated with a lot of health issues. And I see that a lot of people struggling with their weight seem to have very low short chain fatty acids. So we'll give these patients a lot of fiber supplements and we'll reboot their microbiome. It also tests something called beta glucuronidase. Beta glucuronidase is such an interesting marker. It's something that'll recycle estrogens and toxins from your gut. The fascinating thing is that I see high beta-glucuronidase in patients who have issues with high estrogen levels or estrogen symptoms in their body. For example, they may have breast cysts or thyroid nodules or endometriosis or fibroids or even breast cancer survivors. I see high beta-glucuronidase. The amazing thing is this can be blocked with something called calcium deglucurate. And what's so remarkable to me is I've seen many women who have struggled with breast pain for years. And for the first time ever, after giving them calcium deglucurate, their breast pain is completely gone because we have blocked the toxic estrogen recycling from their gut. So the next section of the test is looking at your entire bacterial profile. So they'll measure out all the bacteria 
And the nice thing is they have data from research showing that certain bacteria are associated with certain diseases so that we can improve that. Then, then they have two pages of parasite analysis, so looking for all the very subtle parasites that can be missed on standard tests. It'll look for H. pylori, which is the bacteria that causes stomach ulcers and stomach cancers. And then it'll look for any overabundance of any normal commensal bacteria that may be causing your symptoms. And then finally, there's a fungal culture section. So if there's overgrowth of candida or other yeast, that'll also come up on the report. So based on these results, I'm then able to guide patients with specific protocols targeting their active gut issues. And the amazing thing is once we heal their gut issues, patients have such a significant improvement, not just in their gut symptoms, but in their overall health. You know, autoimmune disease, brain fog, joint pains, mood issues, hormonal issues, they all improve. And then six months to a year later, we could always repeat the test if we want to see the progress that we're making. So do you know your food allergies? So one man's meat is another man's poison. Knowing your food allergies is so important. You may think you're eating healthy, but if you're eating foods you're allergic to, it may actually be causing you symptoms. And like I said, a lot of food allergies are not obvious. So over the years, I've done food allergy tests on patients, and they were blown away when they got the report. They had no idea. They were eating those foods every day. So the test I like to do is the IgE immunocap assay for a very extensive list of foods. Like, I'll typically run 36 foods. And I find this test to be the best way to test for food allergies. It's more sensitive than the skin test. So for something to be positive on the skin test, it has to be of a certain severity, whereas the blood test will pick up on very minor allergies, and it gives us the quantitative severity. So then we can decide what, you know, whether we need to eliminate that food or reduce that food from your diet. The IgE immunocap test is also considered very medically valid. It's used in allergy publications internationally, and so it's something that we can follow if you want to repeat it you know, five years later. We can always repeat the test. Common food allergies that we see are gluten, which is the protein in, in all wheat products, dairy, which is cow's milk, soy, eggs, peanuts, and also shellfish. Unfortunately, there is no very valid test for food sensitivities. There's a lot of tests out there, but I've used them over the years, and none of them are considered medically valid, and they can lead to a lot of confusion. So my preference is not to use any of those tests for food sensitivities. So what I like to do is do the valid one for food allergies, rule that out, and then we can figure out your food sensitivities based on elimination. So let me give you an example. Let's say you did your blood test and your IgE to wheat was negative. So you're not allergic to wheat, but when you cut out wheat from your diet, you feel great. And when you add it back, you feel bloated and you get a headache. Then I would say you are sensitive to wheat and it may be worth continue, continue to eliminate wheat from your diet. So what type of diet is ideal for you? There's so, no single diet that's best for everyone. We really have to tailor it to your food allergies, your sensitivities, and it depends on your diagnoses. There are certain principles that I recommend across the board. So I recommend a whole foods diet. So that means nothing processed. You don't want something with a long ingredient label. I recommend five colors a day, which means you want colorful berries, carrots, purple cabbage, green vegetables. So you want a broad spectrum of colors because then you're getting all the antioxidants in your diet. Eat organic as much as possible to avoid the pesticides and the GMO foods. If you are on a budget, I recommend at least get the dirty dozen items organic because those are the highest in pesticides. Incorporate good fats in your diet. So by good fats, I mean like avocados, olive oil, nuts, Good fat is so important for your brain, for your hormones, and good fats help to keep you full. You have clean, organic, wild proteins in your diet. So this is like pasture-raised eggs, organic chicken, organic turkey, wild salmon, and then grass-fed beef. Vegetarian then recommend um, legumes and uh, lentils and nuts and seeds. Vegetables. So vegetables are the most important part of your diet because vegetables are so anti-inflammatory and they give your gut microbiome all the good fiber it needs. 
I always recommend eat protein, fat, and fiber at every meal to keep your blood sugar stable. So you never want to just snack on a carb by itself because then your blood sugar just goes up and down. And then lastly, it really depends on your condition. So if you have diabetes or metabolic issues, I may advise on cutting back on grains in your diet. If you have autoimmune disease, I may advise on avoiding gluten, dairy, and lectins in your diet. So that is something I specialize in my practice, is helping patients navigate their diet based on their diagnoses. So this is a food pyramid that I drew, and I put vegetables at the bottom. Because vegetables, like I said, are the most important part of your diet. You want to aim for, I always tell patients, one pound of vegetables per day. It sounds like a lot, but it makes such a difference. Vegetables are the key to reversing most chronic diseases, whether it's hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, and preventing cancer. All, the, all different types of vegetables, cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens, colorful vegetables. And you want the good fat and protein at every meal. You can have a little fruit, you know, like organic apples, berries, seasonal fruit, and then a little bit of basmati rice, yams, and then a little bit of spices. Turmeric, again, is very anti-inflammatory. Cinnamon is great to sweeten up your food. And then tea and coffee I put at the top of the pyramid. So this is my avoid list. So I would definitely recommend avoid refined sugar in the diet because it's so inflammatory. Try to minimize or avoid alcohol if you can. Dairy I put as an avoid because today I'm talking about gut health and there's such a prevalence of lactose intolerance and so that can cause a lot of bloating issues for patients. Trans fat. So trans fat is deep fried foods or hydrogenated oils, very bad for you. Processed foods, preservatives, and your food allergies, whatever they are. So what are the top food cul culprits for IBS symptoms? So again, sugar and artificial sugar. Gluten. So gluten is the protein in all wheat products. It's also in soy sauce, and it's in, in oats as well, unless the oats is certified gluten-free. Gluten sensitivity is definitely on the rise, and this may be due to the fact that most wheat products are genetically modified, and hence they're inflammatory on the gut. Dairy, again, because of the prevalence of lactose intolerance, where pe people can't break down the lactose sugar, it causes a lot of bloating. Inflammatory oils, so these are like the vegetable oils, canola, corn, soybean oil, additives, and then lectins. Many of you are familiar with lectins? Lectins is that outer protective coating of legumes and whole grains, and it's also present in some seeded vegetables. But I'll give you an example. So like a bean it has that outer coating, and it was designed that way. It's the defense mechanism of the bean to withstand being digested because the ultimate goal is for that bean to get through your digestive tract and become a plant somewhere. So it's not an issue for everyone, but for patients with irritable bowel syndrome, the lectins can cause gut inflammation, bloating, and pain. So I'll have patients who tell me when they eat quinoa, they get immediate abdominal pain. Again, because quinoa has a nice outer coating. So certain seeded vegetables like cucumbers, bell peppers, and zucchini, these also have a lot of lectins. If you want to learn more about lectins, I highly recommend the book Plant Paradox by Dr. Stephen Gundry. Fascinating book, fascinating. So what are some gut healing foods? So if someone is having digestive issues, whether it's IBS or they're having a diverticulitis flare or food poisoning or they're having a viral gastroenteritis, these are typically the foods that help them, you know, help, that are easy to tolerate on their gut. So typically we'll do soups and stews with bone broth. Again, bone broth is rich in glutamine, which is healing to the enterocytes that line the gut. Basmati rice. So again, basmati rice has no lectins, and it has a relatively low glycemic index of 55, so it's fairly well tolerated. And then ghee. Ghee is clarified butter. So it's butter that has had all the casein and whey proteins removed. Ghee has been used in Ayurvedic medicine for centuries. It's very well tolerated by patients. Scented foods, so these are like the sauerkraut, kimchi. Typically vegetables, I recommend cooked. If you're having any digestive issues, start with cooked vegetables. Do organic cooked leafy greens or steamed vegetables. Then you want to have organic eggs, chicken, wild fish, grass-fed beef.
You can use ginger in your cooking. You can have ginger tea or put it in soups. Ginger is so good for gut motility. Turmeric. Turmeric is the yellow spice used in Indian cooking. And it has an active compound called curcumin, which is very anti-inflammatory on the body. So eating mindfully can help IBS. So a lot of us live very crazy fast-paced lives where we're eating on the go, we're eating in front of a computer screen. So that's not very good because that can interfere with the way your body processes the food. Just preparing your own food, getting in touch with your food, that sets the stage for a healthy digestion. When you smell your food, that allows your body to make the pancreatic enzymes that's gonna help digest it better. In a relaxed atmosphere is so important because of, again, the brain-gut uh, connection. You wanna avoid rushed meals. Me eat mindfully. The other nice thing is if you eat mindfully and enjoy every bite, you're less likely to overeat. You want to focus and chew your food, so important. You know, enjoy food with friends and family and eat in a happy atmosphere, so important. There's even research now showing that meditation can help patients with IBS. This is an example of a colorful, clean, whole foods meal that I made and I shared with my patients on Instagram and Facebook. So this is a wild salmon with pineapple salsa and an asparagus stir fry with white basmati rice. I wanted to bring this up because pineapple actually has natural digestive enzymes, something called bromelain, that helps you digest your proteins. And it tastes amazing too. So it's nice to add a little pineapple with your protein. Five colors a day. So this is like a breakfast that I'll have. This is a pasture raised egg, cherry tomatoes, avocado, and then organic blueberries. You wanna feed the microbiome. So this is a purple cabbage salad with a tart lime dressing. It's absolutely delicious and crunchy. And you can make something similar as a sauerkraut as well, purple cabbage sauerkraut, it's very good. I like these kind of pictures. Follow me on Instagram, Facebook. I like to send these ideas out to my patients and get their feedback. I like to stay connected with my patients. Fennel tea, if you haven't heard of it, it's amazing for digestion. It, fennel naturally promotes GI motility and it can help with gas pain. It's great for IBS. In fact, in Indian culture, people actually chew fennel seeds at the end of a meal because that helps with digestion as well. So what are some other natural ways to manage symptoms? So I already mentioned that Digest Zen essential oil. That is amazing. That's made by doTERRA and it works topically. You just massage your abdomen and it brings significant relief of abdominal discomfort. Of enzymes. So enzymes help you digest your food better and there's so many kinds out there. There's amylase, lipase, there's ox bile, there's bovine pancreatin, there's bromelain from pineapple, there's pepain from papaya. And typically I'll give a patient a combination one that's really strong and it works amazing. And in fact, it can help patients handle some of the lectins and some of the things they're having trouble digest. So if they take the enzyme 15 to 30 minutes before they eat, they're able to digest a lot better. Probiotics, again, we spoke about probiotics, so important. It definitely helps improve their microbiome and digest better. Heartburn, I'll, I'll often use something called DGL. DGL is a form of licorice and you can chew it and it gives relief of heartburn. One is aloe gel or aloe juice. Now it has to be pure aloe with no sugar in it. But I have seen it do some amazing things. I've had patients where they tell me they're having such severe chest pressure, they think they're having a heart attack. And then they take a sip of aloe and boom, it's gone. They feel amazing. So it's very powerful. Aloe just coats the entire esophagus and reduces inflammation. Peppermint oil is very nice. You can put peppermint oil in your water and it helps with nausea. It really promotes digestion. And you can also buy peppermint in capsules as well. Tea, like we talked about, and ginger tea as well, are very good for gut motility, help you digest better. Fiber supplements, so not all fiber is created equal. So some of my patients, when they have Metamucil, which is psyllium, they get bloated. It doesn't work well for them. So my favorite fiber supplement is something called Acacia Senegal, and it's made by the brand Heather's Fiber. This is a special fiber because it's considered a low FODMAP fiber, meaning it doesn't cause bloating, especially if you have SIBO. And the nice thing is it has no taste. You can add it to water and drink it. 
So I typically have patients start out with a low dose, you know, like one tablespoon, and then gradually increase the dose until they feel they're having really good bowel movements every day. For constipation, my favorite things are magnesium citrate, as I mentioned. I also use aloe capsules. This is different from the aloe gel. These are the actual aloe leaf in a capsule form. Aloe leaf is a, promotes gut motility. And then fiber, like I spoke of, we want to bulk up the stools and titrate up the acacia uh, fiber until the patients are having really good bowel movements. So this is how I evaluate patients in my practice. So I practice integrative medicine. So I always like to look at the whole person. And my goal is always to figure out what are the root causes of symptoms. So often we'll do it in phases. You know, first we'll work on their diet. We'll work on nutrition, get their vitamins optimized. Then we'll work on hormonal balance, both in men and women. Work on their digestive health, which is like everything we talked about today. Testing to figure out what their food allergies are and figure out what their sensitivities are. We may do genetic testing, like through 23andMe, to customize recommendations based on, on their genes. Think about mental, emotional, and spiritual factors that may be affecting their health. You know, depending on their occupation or their profession and their exposures, we may test for toxins like mercury, arsenic, lead, things that may be affecting their health. And if we find those things, I can help them with a very gentle detox protocol to get those things out of the body. Lastly, you know, we'll look for infections. Is there a virus, a bacteria, or parasite, or yeast that may be affecting their health? So the great thing is when we address all of these areas, patients see such an improvement in their health. So I like to provide a very strong preventative approach, but then I also like to do everything possible to help my patients achieve optimal health. You know, you really want them to be feeling great, energetic, strong, productive, and happy. So to learn more about my practice, definitely visit my website. It's oc-integrative-medicine.com. And then on my website, I have links to Facebook and Instagram. So follow me, you'll get all my health updates. And then if you're interested to make an appointment, please give my office a call. I do accept four major PPOs, and I am a primary care doctor for teens and adults of all ages. So I just wanna thank St. Jude for giving me the opportunity to speak today. And thank you to all my friends and patients for coming out this evening. It's always great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you.